Tena koto te fano, o Auckland Unitarian. Tena koto na monuhiri. No mai haere mai ki tene fare karakia o te atua. Ko jandaleo toko inua. No reira tena koto, tena koto, tena tato katoa. Welcome all from near and far to our virtual sanctuary. Welcome also to those watching our recording at a later time. I would like to extend a very special thank you to today's speaker, Peter Lynham, whose words we'll hear later in our service. My name is John DeLeo, and I'll be leading our service today. You may not have noticed, but today is Pentecost Sunday. In the words of that ultimate source of all truth, Wikipedia, I quote, Pentecost is a Christian holiday which takes place on the 50th day, the seventh Sunday, after Easter Sunday. It commemorates the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles and other followers of Jesus Christ while they were in Jerusalem celebrating the Feast of Weeks, as described in chapter 2 of the Christian biblical text, Acts of the Apostles. Pentecost is one of the great feasts in the Eastern Orthodox Church, a solemnity in the Roman Rite of the Catholic Church, a festival in the Lutheran churches, and a principal feast in the Anglican Communion. Many Christian denominations provide a special liturgy for this holy celebration. Since its date depends on the date of Easter, Pentecost is a movable feast. Later in this service, we'll hear from Peter about the story of Pentecost and what its message could mean for us today. For my words of welcome, I've chosen a piece by Marilyn Falkowski. We welcome you. We know you come here for different reasons, to find community, to seek your spiritual and personal truths, to question, to nurture your heart and soul, to be nurtured, to explore new ideas, to find comfort, and perhaps to find the answers to some of your bigger questions. We welcome you. We know you come from different places, different religions, different beliefs, and different backgrounds. We hope you will find comfort, connection, challenge, and love here. We hope you will find ways to provide outreach to others in our congregation, in our local community, and in our world community. For today's opening song, I've selected hymn number 159, This Is My Song. The recording was produced by Michael Tacey. For my opening words, I've chosen a piece by Don Shea Cooley. The diversity of the human species is astounding. The fact that we can gather together for common experience is nothing short of a miracle. Today, let us celebrate some of those differences. Let us celebrate those who worship best through music, for whom the holy speaks through rhythm and harmony, pitch and meter. Let us celebrate the interpersonal worshiper who finds the sacred in relationships and community. Let us celebrate those who worship best through the visual world, for whom the divine speaks through the aesthetics of a space. Let us celebrate the verbal and linguistic worshiper for whom words and languages Stories and poetry are sacred sources of joy and revelation. Let us celebrate those to whom the divine might be found in logical reasoning, in mathematics, and through critical thinking. Let us celebrate the intrapersonal worshiper, those who experience the holy as they listen to the still small voice within themselves. Let us celebrate those who worship best through their bodies, those to whom the divine speaks through movement and physical action. And let us celebrate the naturalistic worshiper, for whom the sacred is found in plants and animals, mountains and valleys, deserts and forests, oceans and streams. Today we may find a way to connect with the ultimate, each according to our own ways of understanding and experiencing the world. May we bring our whole selves to this service and celebrate the diversity amongst us. We seek our place in the world and the answers to our heart's deep 
questions. As we seek, may our hearts be open to unexpected answers. May the light of our chalice remind us that this is a community of warmth, of wisdom, and welcoming of multiple truths. If you wish, you're welcome to recite with me, while muted, of course, the covenant of our congregation. For your reference, I've pasted the words into the Zoom chat. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is the sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve humankind in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow in harmony, thus do we covenant with each other and with our God. At this time, I'm going to play Spirit of Life. I'm once again going to be playing one of my favorite recordings of the song, that by the All Souls Virtual Choir, which includes the verse sung first in Spanish, then in English. I've pasted both sets of lyrics into the Zoom chat so you can follow along. For today's intermediate hymn, I've selected number 318, We Would Be One. The recording I'm playing is one I've played a few times before by the First Unitarian Church of Baltimore. So now at this time, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker for today, Peter Lynham. Peter is a professor emeritus of history at Massey University and a colleague of Ted Zorn's. Unfortunately, due to a scheduling mix up, Peter ended up being unable to join us live. He has instead provided a video of his remarks, which he recorded earlier this week. Hello there, this is Peter Lynham. I'm so sorry that we're not able to meet in person. And uh, I do trust that at some stage we'll be able to rectify that. But I thought that this being in regular Christian calendar, the day of Pentecost, you might find it interesting to reflect on the occasion and to see what you make of it. So let me just read you a bit from the um, account that is in the book of Acts in the New Testament. It starts off that when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, this is a passage that may seem a bit unnerving and a bit uh, Pentecostal, for any of us, but I want you to come with me on a journey today as we kind of imagine what's going on. I do find it very interesting to conceive of that first day of Pentecost. Remember that Jerusalem was a walled city in those days and with two great buildings in it. The first one, the huge temple that Herod the Great had been building uh, and had continued to be built after his death. A massive, massive structure. Uh, and then also the Roman battalions barracks were a very large presence. Uh, they served also as a palace, we think, for the governor. Now, the governor would only visit Jerusalem on a regular occasions. And this occasion was one where he would have been there because it was one of the three feasts that the Jews celebrated uh, at this particular time. So the first one is Pentecost, then there's the second one when they bring in the wheat harvest, and the third one, uh, much later in September, the so-called Great Day of Atonement. And at those occasions, enormous crowds of people would gather in the city, uh, and so there was a matter of public order, and so the governor and the troops would be present to maintain order. Uh, so we can imagine the narrow streets of Jerusalem having been crowded out and great surprise 
would be when there is a disturbance of the streets uh, while the latest messianic movement, I think we would probably call it a cult, um, uh, was surging out in the streets with inexplicable sounds of wind, with what appeared to be f fire raging over the people who'd come out of the place where they'd been gathering. And then the streets are full of blabbing Galileans, the real hick countrysiders of the Jewish world. And they're talking very, very loudly. But what's the language that they're speaking? And then the visitors to the city, and there would be a lot of visitors for every uh, Jewish feast time, um, uh, discover that they can hear through the hubbub the Galileans speaking their own languages, the vernacular languages from all across the known Roman world and beyond it. This is a very crazy event early in this uh, morning in Jerusalem. Now, it must have been particularly strange when they discover that they had thought, the Jews, that they'd put an end to the Jesus movement by crucifying the rebel that was at the heart of it. But now, 50 days later, at the next feast, there seems to be a new cycle of action. What sense to make of this occasion, they must have wondered. And what sense do we make of it in our modern world? Uh, and what sense do you make of it as Unitarians? Um, well, I think there's quite, a, quite an interesting issue um, to explore. It's clear that these events are really important because this marks the moment, really significant in religious history, when the Christian movement begins to emerge as a distinct movement. Jesus had clearly been operating within Judaism. Now there's something beginning to happen, which still seems within Judaism, but it increasingly pulls apart. And when in 66 AD, the peoples of Jerusalem and Judea rebel against the Roman Empire and the Roman Empire comes in with great force against them, then the Christians are clearly separate from the Jews and evacuate Jerusalem and leave the Jews to their fate. So there's a trend here in these stories, but the trend begins here at Pentecost, and I want to just see what sense to make of it. Now, I think probably the most uncomfortable aspect of this Pentecostal, Pentecost story, which leaves respectable people, whether they're Unitarians or Anglicans, or Buddhists for that matter, somewhat troubled, is the noisiness of the occasion. We educated especially, educated people like religion to be respectable, refined, quiet. But a good deal of religion across the world has never been like that. Um, I have the feeling that Europeans, with a certain level of, of education, dismiss anything that gets noisy. We're, we're probably quite inclined to do what the Jews did at that day, call it drunken behaviour incapable of refined religion, which we are aiming for. But I think it's time that we reconsidered our attitude. I think there's something very flawed about it. Of course, I know that, for example, Unitarian hymnology, deeply influenced by John Greenleaf Whittier with his famous uh, verse, Drop the still Jews of quietness till all our striving cease. And especially the next verse. Breathe through the heats of our desire, thy coolness and thy balm. Let sense be dumb. Let flesh retire. Speak through the earthquake, wind and fire, O still small voice of calm. But if that is a normal Unitarian, or indeed, you know, general uh, Christian attitude, uh, actually it's highly predicated on our cultural baggage rather than our religious convictions. You may be surprised to hear that 
There was a movement in early Unitarian thought in the early 19th century, which is called by historians the Methodist Unitarian Movement or the Unitarian Methodist Movement. You get both terminologies used because this is people looking on at it afterwards. Here was people who rejected the Trinity and combined the distinctive theology of Unitarians with the ranting style of the Methodists. The, these people were from the northeast of Lancashire. They were poor. They were led by a man called Joseph Cook, who had been converted to Methodism in the early 1790s. It was a Methodist preacher for a period, but was kicked out of the conference in 1805 for his wicked preaching. He was a very popular preacher, but he said uh, that when a sinner returns to God, according to the requisitions of the gospel, God accepts that sinner whether or not he has any comfortable persuasion of it in his mind or not. So he's not quite a Unitarian at that point. But as his followers built a chapel in Union Street in Todd Morden, later called Providence Chapel, and then began building branches in other parts of northeast Lancashire, New Church and other places, they became quite distinctive in their religious views, and eventually Unitarians owned them as fellow members. They provided music with a barrel organ. There were new preachers that joined after Cook died. Um, and they were finally discovered by the Unitarians in 1819. But when they discovered them, it was really quite striking because here were noisy Unitarians. Uh, there was delightful descriptions of the ways in which these poor weavers and spinners with their aprons and clogs one of them smoking his pipe, would gather together and engage in religious conversation with great readiness. And th this distinctive flavour was so striking, but so appealing to a community, which after all was a working class community with a rough, ready approach to knowledge in which it was kind of a combination of um, distinctive, working class, self-taught learning, and quite striking challenges to traditional views. And so amongst the Methodist Unitarians, writes uh, one of the writers about it, uh, with their hearty country life, their earnest praying ways, their love of vigorous, unconventional, extemporary preaching, their capacity for being wrought up into fever and enthusiasm, uh, this preacher found himself more at home than in the ordinary type of Unitarian congregation. And it's very interesting because this was a need of the community and a desire of the community, which Unitarians later recognized that they'd lost. And indeed, the founder of your congregation was, before he came to New Zealand, part of an attempt to rediscover a voice in the British working class world. Well, I've taken a while to describe this story because I think sometimes we let aesthetics define the type of religion we think is acceptable. But consider, you know, black churches, for example, the, there's a cultural aspect that means that in some societies, the noisy, the popular is the way in which religion is expressed. Um, we, I don't think, can afford to reject religious groups just because of this, the style of the way they do things. We've got to listen to what they say. Now, a second factor that I am struck by in this story is the way in which every one of the 120 people who had gathered uh, and were among this early Christian group that came down into the streets, every one of them had this flame of fire apparently above them, and every one went out to speak in the power that they'd experienced. Now, here again, we've got a striking description of a very different sort of church than what came to develop uh, in later centuries. 
because the church increasingly disempowered laity, disempowered women, disempowered those whose gender and sexuality was unusual. Now, I grant you that there was still a preacher, Peter, who gave the sermon that day, but it was the ordinary believers who drew the crowd because the Spirit of God did not rest solely on one person, rested on them all. And so that this picture of the Spirit like a flame on each person is a symbol of a striking kind of community in which all are endowed with a sense of God. Such an important theme for us to recover. Of course, we need learned expert people. I'm the last person to deny that. But there's also a profound sense that our task is to encourage ordinary people to know that they are significant, that they matter. And here's where, in many ways, um, properly understood, Christianity is deeply influential in our notion of a democratic society. A democratic society says that all voices should be treated equally. Everyone has a place for a voice. In our increasingly elitist age, I think there's a tremendous risk that we will undermine democracy. And I think it's important for religions to discover their calling to strengthen democracy. And my final point, more briefly, is the theme of unity in diversity. Um, this might take us off into a whole interesting story. Um, do you remember from the Old Testament those strange stories of the darkness when the world was created and then the Spirit of God breathing over the waters? And then the creation of Adam and Eve, uh, who are then, because they sin, driven out of the Garden of Eden and lose paradise. And then a chapter later, their two sons, Cain and Abel, are scrapping, and Cain kills Abel, and his punishment is that he is to wander the earth. Then, a few chapters later, in Genesis chapter 11, there's the great plan of the people that they will build themselves a city with a tower that goes right up into the heavens, and they will make a name for themselves. And instead, God scatters them abroad and confuses their languages so that there's no possibility of human unity. Now, in a real sense, Pentecost takes up those bad stories, those judgment stories of the Old Testament, and turns them on their heads. It suggests that now the world may be reunited. For what the Spirit did, as the Spirit fell on the assembled group, was to enable them to speak the languages of all the peoples who were present. So in practice, the vernacular languages, you understand that these were Jews, but many of the Jews were after the exile in 586 BC, stayed in the places where they'd been exiled. And there were little Jewish conclaves right throughout much of the known world of that period. And some would come back to Jerusalem for the festivals. And they must have known Aramaic, otherwise they would not have been able to have understood what was going on in Peter's sermon, for example. But they had their own native language, and they would really have heard it in Jerusalem. But here's this description, uh, and there's a list of places, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. Wow, what an assortment of people. It's a picture of the world. And see, they're not, they're, remember, they're Jews, but they're from Jews from all over. And in this description, which moves from the east across to the north, across to the west, across to the south, each hears God being praised in their own language. And the curious thing is that we might imagine that the curse of the fall, that the curse of the scattering of the Tower of Babel, which was an attempt to unite people and failed, is now reversed. 
reversed through the action of God. God who had scattered is now the God who gathers. And yet God does not gather by just giving them a single language, a new single language. God speaks now to them in all of their languages because the distinctive aspect of the story is that cultural variation is acknowledged and admits. See, this is where so often we we just wonder at the present time, is there any possibility of peace? Because we are so divided into our national boundaries, our cultures, our languages, and it feels as though there is no way to overcome these, and churches and religions divide along these lines too. But I think that here is a picture of a potential future where all cultures weave together in this centre, in this moment, which is an expression of a future hope, that there will be peace and there will be hope uh, in a world where at last people freely respond to God. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that exploration. I do hope you have an interesting discussion about it. We thank Peter for his generosity in sharing his thoughts with us today and hope that at a later time, he'll be able to join us in person and speak with us on another topic. Now, please join with me as we say the words for extinguishing the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. For today's closing song, I've selected hymn number 1054, Let This Be a House of Peace. Funnily enough, the recording I'm playing was also produced by the First Unitarian Church of Baltimore. At this time, we're going, oh, sorry, jumped ahead in my script. For my closing words, I've chosen something that I wouldn't normally choose, a prayer of all things. Um, this happens to be, if you search in the UUA's database of words for worship, the one and only item that is tagged Pentecost. So I decided to go ahead and use it, even though I'm not a big fan of things called prayers. Holy One, you who dwells within and among us, let us remember the blessings of purpose that we have received throughout our lives. When the fire of our soul burned brightly, those moments of clarity, when our direction felt in line with a greater purpose, when the doors of opportunity were easy to see and even easier to open, those moments of clarity when even strangers felt like family, we ask this day to have that clarity of spirit come forth into our lives again with the power of a mighty wind, opening the horizons of our hearts and minds to that inner fire which burns inside us all. May we be inspired this day to sing out praise of this glorious life in a language beyond the power of speech, in a language of action, so that our lives might be a beacon of justice and love, and the world might know hope through our story, our song, our steps taken. We ask this day that our inner fire burn brightly with compassion and courage and love for whatever number of days ahead are still ours to claim. These and the many prayers of our hearts, we pray now in the silence. Amen. At this time, we're going to divide into small group, small discussion groups in our Zoom breakout rooms. I'll keep the breakout rooms going for about 15 minutes, after which we'll all be returned to the main conversation. And Peter has very kindly provided some questions to get our discussion started. Basically, what do you think of his main points? Can noisy religions, noisy religions, be valid for some people? Do you think that there are religious arguments in favor of democracy? 
And how do we reconcile cultural and language difficulties with world harmony and peace? So the questions are pasted into the Zoom chat for your reference. And I'll go ahead and start some breakout rooms.